going live. So guys, thank you for tuning in to TuesNet Live. I think this is our 11th one. Um, and we've been going through the same big theme. We've been walking through Jesus' life, looking at our big theme of that you may have life, Jesus' purposeful plan of redemption, about how Jesus came on purpose with a plan to redeem us and to give us new life. Um, so before we get too deep into it, let's pray and invite the Lord into our time. Jesus, thank you for this night. Thank you for technology that we can connect with so many awesome people uh, from who are, live so far away and get to talk about you and get to learn about you. I pray you bless our time and study tonight. I wouldn't just know more um, about you with our minds, but we actually know you more um, and that we would have more strength to walk in the new life that you give us after this night. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Anna is going to start our study tonight. <laughs> uh, take it away. Alrighty. So, last time on Tuesday Night Live, Four. we had a lesson called the Triumphal Entry. And that was when Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time before his crucifixion. Um, so, he had spent most of his ministry up in Galilee, which was a few days' journey north of Jerusalem. And then he had been spending time traveling down to Jerusalem, and he had performed miracles along the way. And then um, he entered into Jerusalem. It was like a pretty big deal because this was like the, the starting point of the end of his ministry. Sort of. <laughs> His earthly ministry. That's the word. Um, yeah. And when he entered the city of Jerusalem, there were lots of people with him. Like, like a lot of people. Probably. He had gone viral. Yes. He was <laughs> the olden, ancient times equivalent of going viral. Um, like a lot of people. At least a hundred. Probably more. Um, and they were all praising him and giving him the same sort of welcome welcome that they would have given a king. So that showed that they were recognizing him as the Davidic Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And they genuinely did believe that he was going to be their king or their ruler here on earth. They thought that he was going to enter Jerusalem and kick out the Roman government who had oppressed the Jews for a long time and that he was going to bring them governmental political freedom and religious freedom as well because they would be free to practice their religion however they wanted without Roman oppression. Um, but we also talked about how that wasn't what Jesus came to do. He actually came to Jerusalem to defeat an even bigger enemy than the Romans were to the Jews. He came to defeat sin and death and Satan himself and win eternal victory for not only the Jews who were there, but for all people ever. So that was really cool that that was Jesus' plan. And it wasn't cool that people didn't accept that plan. And instead, they wanted the Jesus that they thought he was in their heads. Um, and so oftentimes, we do the same thing, where we um, have an idea of what we want, and we're stubborn and unwilling to accept the better plan that God has for it, because we think that our plan is going to be better. But we should pray and ask God to change our hearts to be willing to accept what he has for us, because ultimately that's always going to be best. So that was last time on Tuesday Night Live. This time on Tuesday Night Live, our title is called The Last Supper. So we're going to learn about the last Passover supper that Jesus ate with his disciples. So before we read the Bible passage for this week, I'm going to tell you some more about the setting. So. If you remember that Jesus entered Jerusalem during the triumphal entry on Sunday of this week, and you can see on this map over here, um, during before, before the triumphal entry, he came down the Mount of Olives this way, crossed the Kidron Valley, and then entered into Jerusalem in one of the gates that's near the temple. So throughout this last week that Jesus is on earth before he dies, um, he's mostly staying in this area, all around Jerusalem. And so Sunday, he entered Jerusalem. On Monday, he went to the temple, which you can see right here, and 
And so that was when um, the cleansing of the temple happened by Jesus, which means that he went to the temple and he got really angry with people there who were, um, they basically turned it into a market. They were selling animals and changing money, and Jesus went and tipped over their tables and drove out all of the people who were misusing a temple that was supposed to be a holy place for worship. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday, Jesus spent more time around the temple teaching the people who were there. In addition, on either Tuesday or Wednesday, it's unclear in the Bible exactly what happened on which day. But we know that in that time, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anointed Jesus um, one time when they, they were all having dinner together. And then, in addition, during those two days at some point, Judas arranged to betray Jesus. And then that brings us to Thursday, where today's lesson is. Um, and on this day is when he has the Passover meal with his disciples. In addition, all of the Jews in Jerusalem were having a Passover meal on that day. And then next week, we'll learn about later on Thursday, when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. So... Yeah, on this map, you can see the, um, it's an, a prop, like, they think this could have been where the upper room was, but they can't know for sure. Um, so you can see that it's really close to the temple. Um, yeah, so that's where they might have been during today's story. So I'm going to read today's scripture. It's from Luke, chapter 22, verses 7 through 20. You can follow along in your Bible or on the screen. <clears throat> Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So that is the scripture that today's lesson comes from. And I'm going to summarize it a little bit and point out the main points just to sort of recap. So um, it's the day of the Passover, which is this festival that happens every year that the Jews were celebrating. Jews today still celebrate it. And even Christians sometimes celebrate it as well. Um, and John will talk more later about what exactly the Passover is. So they were, there's fancy dinner that they were going to have. And it was, it would have been normal for Jesus and his disciples to have this dinner together. Um, so he tends his two disciples, two of them, Peter and John. And basically he says like, go set the table. Um, I don't know if they cooked or if they bought the food or what, but it was their job to get it all ready. Um, and then the time comes, and they actually eat dinner together. And then towards the end of the dinner, Jesus starts giving a little speech and saying all sorts of interesting things. Um, and so if you've studied this before, you probably have some idea of what it means, all the things that Jesus was saying. Um, but if you don't know, that's okay, because one, John will explain it next, and two, <laughs> In our context, in today's world, um, the language that Jesus uses isn't very common for us, and um, especially if you're not super familiar with, like, especially a lot of the different contexts that we get from the Old Testament. 
So Jesus is talking about things like covenant and I don't know, the, the, um, he's referring to sacrifices and stuff. So John's going to explain all of that, but just know that the disciples who like had the Old Testament practically memorized, um, they would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. So yes, now John is going to teach us exactly what Jesus is talking about. Wow, that is a lot of pressure. A number of times. You guys, it's going to be confusing, but don't worry. John is going to teach us. John will make all things clear. Hopefully I can live up to that. Okay, so buckle your seatbelts. We are about to dive into some stuff. Any questions to this point? Not yet. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Tyler Le Capitan. All right. Um, so, four main points about the Last Supper. What, what Anna said is super important to realize. We read the account of the Last Supper, and it seems like there's not a whole lot going on here. It's like, okay, so Jesus is saying he's going to suffer, and he's telling them to you know, do this remembrance of him, this important stuff. But there's like another layer down that we don't get because we're not first century Jews, and we, so we just wouldn't get it. Uh, we're not in the Middle East, we're not, we weren't allowed to tell you, and we're Jewish, so we just wouldn't understand. Um, and we're also not reading this in Hebrew, so that also is to our disadvantage. Um, even though the Gospels were written in Greek. But besides that, uh, that would be another barrier. So, point number one, the Last Supper points back to the first Passover in Egypt. Who can tell me what the first Passover in Egypt was? Anyone? Okay, so what happened was the nation of Israel, uh, who were God's chosen people, were enslaved in Egypt. Do we all remember this or, or have some idea of having heard this at some point? I know what happens, but I'm, like, nervous to talk. Okay, <laughs> worry, sorry. I, I will try to explain it. All right, so um, Israel, this people who were descendants of Abraham, who had made a covenant with God, uh, were enslaved in Egypt, and this is all paraphrase and using contemporary language, but basically God sends Moses in to be like, yo, Pharaoh, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, no, I'm going to keep them because I'm a God, and uh, God says, that's not going to work out well for you, I'm going to send plagues on you, and it's going to hurt, and Pharaoh's like, bring it, yo, and so I brought it, and uh, <laughs> it's word for word for what happened. <laughs> Word translation. That is the original King James version. Um, <laughs> so God brought it in the form of several plagues. We're not going to go through them all. We don't have time. Uh, but the very final plague that God brought was a really serious one. So before each plague, God would send Moses back, and the same dialogue would happen. Moses would be like, seriously, though, dude, like, let God's people go, or else it's going to get worse. And Pharaoh would be like, no, I'm not going to do it, because I'm a God, and then it would get worse. And the last one was really intense. God said, if you don't let my people go, I am going to kill every firstborn child in Egypt. And even though Pharaoh had seen all those plagues come and knew that God was going to make good on his word, he still was so determined that he was a god and he wasn't going to be overthrown by the god of the Israelites that he said no. And so what God did was he told Moses to tell the Israelites, have your people, have my people, kill a lamb and put the, the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of their house to mark them as my people. And so when I come kill the firstborns of the people in Egypt, I'll know who my people are, that they're covered by the blood of the Lamb, <clears throat> and I'll pass over them, and they'll be spared, but the people of Egypt will not be. And this is a really, really intense story. It sounds like God's being mean. He is being wrathful. Um, if you have more questions about it, please call or email, or ask your priest or pastor. Um, but, so, every firstborn in Egypt does die, except for the children of Israel because they are protected following God's instructions. And so Pharaoh finally defeated, because even his own son died, Pharaoh finally defeated by this show of God's strength, says, okay, get out. Like, I, I just get out of here. I don't want any more to do with you. This is too terrible to, to grasp. And so Israel is set free 
from their bondage in Egypt. And so they remember God's triumph over the Egyptians and freeing them with a meal, um, a celebration, a festival called the Passover. And it's a little bit different for us in the West because we don't typically have meals that are also like a religious ceremony. It's just not something we do culturally, but that's what the Passover was. It was a meal that was also a religious ceremony. Um, and so been, the Jewish people had been celebrating the Passover, somewhat like how we celebrate Christmas, but not the same way. But just think about it as a really important holiday for them. They've been celebrating it as remembering when God had covered them with the blood of a lamb to set them free from slavery. And so Jesus is marking his death on the cross, telling his, his disciples that he's going to suffer and die, and he's marking this point on the Passover, pointing back in time to the original Passover and saying, essentially, when you read between the lines and look at what was to come later, pointing back and saying, so God passed over the Israelites and set them free from slavery because of the blood of actual lambs. But I am the true Passover lamb and that my blood will be shed for you. And so you will be set free from spiritual slavery to sin. So because of my blood being shed on your behalf, you will be set free. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So that so Jesus is pointing last over back to the first Passover. He also points back, we wouldn't recognize this. Um, so one other point that I almost forgot that's really important. In verse 19, he says um, that he's giving himself for them. Um, let me see if I can actually, oh, we don't have the verses in this. Anyway, he says that he's giving himself to the, to the disciples. And a better translation um, is actually that he sacrifice, he's sac going to sacrifice himself or that he's going to be broken for them. Really, uh, just really bringing it back to more closely what it would be to be like one of the lambs being slaughtered on behalf of the Israelites. So he is sacrificing himself in, in their place, and for, in our place on the cross. And so then point number two is, it also points back to the covenant that Israel made with God in Exodus 24, chapter 24. So what happens here is we, the nation of Israel has been set free from Egypt. They've uh, been wandering in the wilderness. And Moses receives the Ten Commandments and some other decrees from God. And essentially what happens is, is he uh, reads the words of the Lord. And then the people of Israel, as they're gathered there, say, yes, we will affirm these. We will follow the Lord. We're going to follow this. They have committed to God. And so then a really, something happens that seems really weird to us today. It would not have seemed as weird if we were alive from the time of Moses in the Middle East. But it seems really kind of gross. Let's be honest. Brace yourself. And so what they do is they slaughter a bunch of animals in sacrifice, spread the blood on an altar, and then Moses puts the blood on the people. Now the blood had a similar uh, demarcation as the first Passover in terms of marking God's marking the Israelites as God's people, cleansing them from sin, and basically saying that they were uh, one with God. Again, to us in 21st century Western culture, it seems really weird and gross, um, but I encourage you talk to your priest and pastor, um, do some studying on it, and it actually wouldn't be all that. Um, I thought you were about to say I encourage you to go slaughter animals. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, really worried. Uh, I, I discourage you to kill an animal <laughs> and then cover it up with blood. I'm going to oh go God. on record for that one. Um, it's recorded. Don't worry. It, so. Yeah, I, don't, don't go kill an animal and then cover yourself in its blood. Oh, okay. that, that, would, that would be weird. I'm sorry. I'm John Eisman, and I endorse that message. All right. So, <laughs> point number, does, ever, does that make sense? We're glossing over quite a bit of material, but essentially the point is Jesus is pointing back to these, these events, the Passover and the making of covenant, covenant meeting like really important spiritual promise um, that would have been a really big deal. Uh, for Jewish people that the disciples would have known from Old Testament scriptures as really big deals. He is using language that's pointing back to these events. So he is connecting the Last Supper. Uh, he's connecting his sacrifice with these events, kind of putting it in a context and aligning himself with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
you guys? Yep. Oh, cool. And so then he's also drawing their attention to the actions that he's about to take. Um, so he tells them that they're to do this in remembrance of him like as often as they gather. Um, so what he's doing is saying, you are to remember my body broken for you and my blood poured out for you when you gather together in my name. And so what he's doing is, is he's, he's looking at the past, as we just said, but then he's also looking at the now, saying, I'm about to have my body broken and my blood shed for you on your behalf. Going forward, I want you to remember this because this is the center point of my plan of redemption. My dying in your place for your sins on the cross. And then, of course, we remember rising from dead and ascending into heaven, right? Um, and so this is why he's marking communion as something that's important. That's why we still do it in church today. And then, so he's looked at the past, he's looked at the present, and then he looks forward to the completion of his plan of redemption. This is point number four at something that prepare yourself for another weird phrase. The Bible's full of weird stuff. A phrase called the marriage supper of the Lamb in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Of course, Revelation hadn't been written at this time, uh, but God knew what he was going to do at the end of time. He knew what was going to be written in Revelation. Um, God spoke it through people and had it written out through people. But anyway, the marriage supper of the Lamb is this idea or, or this event that's going to happen in the future and to boil it down, it's more simple. Basically, it means that it's what will happen when God restores everything, makes everything the way that it should be. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and the plan of redemption will be complete. This plan that has gone on for centuries and, and millennia, and has traced back through the first Passover, through the making of covenant of Israel in Exodus chapter 24, um, and then has the real center point, one of the most, probably the most important action of Jesus dying on the cross, and then looking forward will be completed uh, at the marriage supper of the Lamb um, when everything is made new. So in this point, Jesus is kind of standing in the middle of a timeline, pointing backwards, saying, what I'm about to do lines up with all these things you've seen, and it's also going to look forward to accomplishing this, to making everything new, making everything new. Does that make sense? Just remind me to put these clothes of yours that are in the dryer, Tommy. <laughs> Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. 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 It's kind of confusing. A lot of information. Okay. So next, I love that picture. That is how I felt after I studied all these scriptures and significances. I was just like, "Oh, it's so much information. What does it? Like it's too much." Okay. So what does it mean? First, as has been our theme, it reminds us of Jesus' plan of redemption. Uh, and his plan reveals his love for us because his plan stretches across millennia. And it's so detailed and it's so broad in the fact that he wants all to be saved, but it's also so personal. And that God had you in mind when he crafted this plan of redemption. He had you in mind when he was, um, when he was doing the Passover instituting the Passover with, with the original Israelites, and using that as a foreshadowing for the true Passover with Jesus, right? And a line that we've been using a lot in these studies is you make a plan about something when you care about it. And so God, the deep intricacy of God's plan shows us just how much he loves and cares about us. He cared about us enough to plan for our redemption. And then the second thing that this means for us is it reminds us of the significance of communion. I know we might all come from different backgrounds and, and might not go to church all that often, uh, but Jesus is saying here, we're not going to get into all the theological nuance and differences of beliefs about communion, but something that he is clearly saying here is that communion with fellow believers is something that's important. Um, it's something that, that we shouldn't forget. Sometimes, you know, if communion is so you know, hard to understand or it seems too formal or our church doesn't ever really do it, um, and so it's easy for us to kind of push it to the side. So it's not, it's not but gathering together and, and breaking the bread and, and taking of the cup, whether it's grape juice or you know, non-alcoholic wine or whatever it is, to remember what Jesus did for us is something that's really important. Um, and then finally, it gives us something to look forward to. Jesus is telling us 
what's going to happen at the end of time. He's telling us that he's going to win, that he's won, and he's going to make all things new and make them as they should be. So he gives us something amazing to look forward to, uh, knowing that he has conquered Satan's sin and death, just like I talked about. Any questions there? Okay, so um, that's our takeaway from today. Um, thinking about the Last Supper, uh, be encouraged about uh, how it just shows the depth of Jesus' plan to redeem us, to love us. I encourage you to, to take communion uh, perhaps more seriously than you have in the past. And, and as you do so, not just for the sake of a religious act, but for the sake of um, really remembering in that moment what Jesus did for you and his love for you. And then um, look forward to when Jesus is going to make all things new, because he's still at work in all of our lives, making us new and preparing us for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And next week on Tuesday Night Live, we're going to look at the Garden of Gethsemane, um, looking at Jesus' final moments before uh, he was arrested and um, cried and being crucified. Um, so there's some really important stuff we're going to cover next week as well. Um, so let's pray, and then we'll finish out. So Jesus, thank you uh, for this night. Thank you for everyone who tuned in. Thank you for technology and the fact that we can have this study. Bless us all and help us all closer to you and to know you more. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.